I'm very glad today that as I come to you, I have the privilege of opening the Word of God. And one of my favorite subjects in God's Word is a four-letter word, H-O-P-E. We find God's Word full of that subject, focusing on it many times. I have different acronyms for it. His Overwhelming Peace Experienced. His Overcoming Power Experienced. Just a great blessing to know that as we look into God's Word, that God wants you to have hope. Today, I want us to look in Romans 15, because there we find the subject of hope referred to in two verses. And let's think about both of these. First, let's think about the fact that in verse 4, we find the resource of our hope, God's Word. The God that created the universe wrote this book and gave it to us. And as you look at it, it talks about its education. It says, for whatever was written before was written for our learning. I'm glad today that God wants you and I learning. And when you think about what was written before, my mind automatically goes to the Psalms. Many of you know the Psalms in different ways, and most of you know Psalm 23. And I'm glad that all of us have learned from Psalm 23, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. Or that favorite verse found that we often hear at funerals. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. That's a great educational subject to be involved with. The fact that the Lord, the God of this universe, is our shepherd that cares for us. And like it says in John 10, he's a good shepherd. Or the great reality, the shepherd goes with the sheep the most dark and difficult days. He never leaves us nor forsakes us. It's his education, and he has a purpose for that. Matter of fact, it's the best foundation for any education. And you really can't have a complete education without knowing the Word of God. In 2 Timothy chapter 3, in verse 16, it says, All scripture is given by God and is profitable for four things. For doctrine, simply what is right. How do we know what is right? Because the word of God tells us exactly what's right. I'm thankful that he's given us the Ten Commandments, not the Ten Suggestions. And just even as you look at the Ten Commandments, you can discern what is right. It's profitable for doctrine, what is right, for reproof, what is wrong. Don't we just love that when we're told that we're wrong? Well, let me tell you, anytime you look in the Word of God, it is always right and you're wrong. But it tells you what's wrong for the purpose, for correction. God wants you to make it right. He wants you to have it right. And then for instruction in righteousness, He wants you to live what's right. He's a God that loves to see us learning His Word, that we might be living His Word before a world that needs to see our light shining, that we might glorify him with it. But it says that the man of God might be perfect or complete, thoroughly furnished. In other words, equipped and ready to go. It's a picture of a ship being fully furnished, ready to go. But not only does it give us his education, it gives us, it gives us encouragement. It says in verse 4, For whatsoever things were written before were written for our learning, that we through the patience and comfort of the Scriptures might have hope. It talks about having patience. And uh, all of us deal with that, don't we? Why every day I pray, Lord, give me patience and give it to me right now. The patience and comfort of Scripture. Why can God's Word do that? Verse 5 tells us, Now may the God and patience of comfort grant you to be like-minded toward one another according to Jesus Christ. Often our impatience and lack of comfort creates disunity and division within us. But the God of patience and comfort. Now if I talk about patience, probably some of you already think about a gentleman in the Old Testament. And you realize it says in the Bible, you have heard of the patience of Job. You've heard about it, you know about it, you know the story. But in James chapter 5, it talks about it specifically. In verse 10, 
It says, my brethren, take the prophets who spoke in the name of the Lord as an example of suffering and patience. Indeed, we count them blessed who endure. You've heard of the patience of Job and seen the intended end intended by the Lord, and the Lord is very compassionate and merciful. That's the only way we can make it through any situation. That's what gives us patience, is the fact that we have a great God in heaven who is very compassionate and merciful. And aren't you glad his mercies are new every day? God's mercy is him not giving to us what we deserve. That's his mercy. Think about a president that was known for being patient. Abraham Lincoln was one of my favorite presidents. Of course, I'm from Illinois, so I'm partial that way. And all through the many difficulties and trials that he went through, he was known as a patient man. Probably because he said this, I believe the Bible is the best gift God has ever given to man. All the good from the Savior of the world is communicated to us through this book. The Word of God is something that guided him and helped him so much through those difficult, dark days that he needed to endure during the Civil War. And the patience he manifested was overwhelming. But he refers to the great fact that God's Word is the greatest gift there is for our lives and what we need. I have a song, I just wanna read partially part of it to you. It's called My Precious Book, uh, written by a couple men I know. The Bible is my precious book. It speaks the truth where'er I look. It is my guide from day to day and gives me light along the way. Inspired words from life's, for life's long road to help me bear the heavy load they lift my spirit to God's throne and cheer me when I'm all alone. Listen to the third verse. The Bible tells me of God's love and scripture's way to heaven above. It's clear on Christ we must believe and on God's own son we must receive. As you think about the second aspect of uh, hope found in Romans 15, 13, it's a lot like this coin. There's two sides. You need both sides for it to be one. That first one is the resource of our hope, God's word. But secondly, the reason for our hope, God's word. Listen to the thrilling thoughts of verse 13. Now may the God of hope fill you with joy and peace in believing that you may abound in hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. Think about this perspective that he has. He said, now may the God of hope what is he looking at? What is he focusing on? The same thing Job did when he went through his trials. The God of hope. He looked to God. He lost everything. His family, all his children, his fields, his flocks. You know, much of his finances. But what did he do? He worshiped. He said, naked came out of the womb. Naked will return. The Lord gives and the Lord takes away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. How could a man worship in the worst conditions? Because he believed in the God of hope who was in control. One of the great hopes that we have is we have a God that is absolutely, totally in control, infinite in wisdom and perfect in love. As you think about this, uh, I want you to see its perspective, not only our focus, but our fruit. Now may the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing. Now that word fill you, when I read it, it reminds me of the ice cream cone that I got on vacation in Northern Minnesota. We were up there and the gas station we go to, they have waffle cones with hard pack ice cream. And it thrills me when I go in and one of the choices is their coffee ice cream. It's pretty expensive when you get the waffle cone and it says one dip, like $4. But when they fill that cone, it's more than one dip. Matter of fact, I got one one time and I wasn't even paying attention and the young man doing it says, is this enough? And I looked around at the cone and it had to be three to four inches. The ice cream, three to four inches. But he filled it. And this is what God wants to fill us with, his fruit. And two of those fruit that you find in Galatians 5 that the Spirit brings in our lives, 
The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace. It says to fill you with joy. What fills you with joy? And joy stands for Jesus occupying you. Jesus himself said in John chapter 10, that these things have I spoken to you, that your joy might be full. The word of God has been given to us that our joy might be full. I'm not talking happiness. Happiness depends on happenings. Joy depends on Jesus. And his word has been given to us that our joy might be full. Secondly, not only our joy, but our peace. A lady gave me this acronym for peace. Precious experience a Christian enjoys. That's what our perspective is. As we look at this God of hope, what he wants in our lives is joy and peace. He's done everything to give that peace to us. Paul earlier in Romans had said, therefore being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. The only way to have peace with God is through the Lord Jesus Christ. And in Philippians chapter four, we read that we can have peace from God. He wants us to have his peace. We see it in his perspective. We see it in its person. Our filling there. That you and I are filled. That we may abound in hope. If you want to know the picture of abound, just look at the Cedar River after about five inches of rain. That's what that word pictures. To be out of its boundaries. Would you say as you look at your life that it's out of its boundaries sometimes? Jesus said in John chapter 10 that he's come to give us life and give us life more abundantly, abounding. And that abounding is from the first two, joy and peace. That's how we have that abundant life. And our fullness is found in the power of the Holy Spirit. He's the only one that can produce these things in our lives. It's not something that you produce from the flesh. It can only be brought into your heart and life by faith in Christ through the power of the Holy Spirit given to everyone that believes. So as you think about the resource of our hope, God's word, and the reason for our, our hope, God's work, let me ask you to take the two keys that unlock this hope in your heart. The first one is in a word in there. It says, now may the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing. The essential element for eternal life is believing. As Paul began the book of Romans, he says this, for I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. Gospel, that's the fact that Jesus died, was buried and rose again. God's only son provided eternal life. He said, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ for it's the power of God unto salvation. What do we need salvation for? Paul later says, for the wages of sin is death, saved from the penalty of sin, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. That gospel, it is the power, it is the way that you and I get salvation. For everyone who believes, the essential element of eternal life is believing. You've heard me say more than once from one time when I've been teaching and preaching, read the Gospel of John, and every time you come across that word believe, stop and think about it. You'll do that about 90 times, depending on your translation. And if God says something 90 times in one Gospel, he's trying to make it clear, and the Bible is clear that believing is the essential element for eternal life. You have to believe in it. And then it says there, it's by the Holy Spirit. By the Holy Spirit. Paul goes into great detail in Romans chapter 8 to talk about the Holy Spirit. He makes it clear if you don't submit to him, you'll live in the flesh. He makes it clear that if you don't have the Holy Spirit, you're probably not a Christian. Because in verse 14, it says, For as many are led by the Spirit of God, are the sons of God. Listen to these verses. They are thrilling. Verse 24 says, For we are saved in this hope, but hope that is seen is not hope. For why does one still hope for what he sees? That's referring to Hebrews chapter 11. Now faith is the substance of things hoped for, 
the evidence of things not seen. But if we hope for what we do not see, we eagerly wait with patience. With patience. Likewise, the Spirit also helps our weaknesses, for we do not know what we should pray for as we ought, but the Spirit itself makes intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. It amazes me that one of the greatest gifts that God has given to us outside of his word is the privilege of prayer. And so many people don't pray and they say, I can't pray or they feel uncomfortable praying. And here it tells you and I that we have all the help we need to pray to God. It's there for us. And it's because of his person in us leading us in that. So isn't it thrilling today to have hope? You should enjoy it because you have the resource of it, his word. Are you in it? And you have the reason for it, God's work. Do you listen to him? That's why I love the song, trust and obey, for there's no other way to be happy in Jesus, to trust and obey. Let's pray. Father, thank you today that you gave us the greatest book there is for all of our life, every part of it. And not only that, you've given us the person of your spirit to dwell within us, to help us to understand it and to do whatever you want us to. In Jesus' name, amen. <music>